Good morning. Going to be on until 11 o'clock this morning, but before I turn to my guest, who is a very good one this morning, I want to give you something to chew on on this most recent and unhappy and tragic air crash, the one up at Pawpaws Bay. The suggestion is made in the headlines this morning that it may have been caused by unnecessary landings required by licenses issued by the federal government. It's a subject that I know a little about. And I'm not going to say that unnecessary landings caused this or any other crash. But I want you to get it quite clear in your mind what must be cleared up at the inquest and what must be cleared up by the federal authorities. Let me put it this way. Conditions of certain licenses require that non-stop routes are not allowed to be flown. You must put down and take off again. It is a fact of life that any landing or takeoff in any plane, be it a jet, be it a jumbo or a 707, or a beaver or a twin otter or a piper cub, any landing and takeoff increases the hazard of flying. No greater than crossing the road, perhaps, but it still increases the hazard of flying. Now, in the specific situation we're looking at right now, Tai, who are owned by West Coast Air Service, he's not quite approved yet, but that's the fact of life, were putting into Portpoise Bay on one of these non stop, uh, scheduled stops on their flight. It's better demonstrated, however, in the services between Vancouver and Victoria. Air West has the license to fly non-stop from Vancouver to Victoria, and it does. West Coast Air also carries passengers between Vancouver and Victoria, but it is a condition of its license that it must not make a non-stop flight, because inherent in that license is that it must serve the Gulf Islands, a community of interests on the license between Vancouver and the Gulf Islands and the Gulf Islands in Victoria. But what West Coast does, in effect, to be able to compete with Air West, is that six or seven times a day, the plane touches down between Victoria and Vancouver at Bedwell Harbour on Pender Island doesn't actually go to the dock. The door opens, the door closes again, and the plane takes off. Do you get the picture? I mean, to the man in the street, the situation is quite crazy. Either the federal authorities don't know what they're doing, or the air carriers are doing something they might not or should not be doing. You see, Air West would tell me that West Coast are trying to compete with their lucrative um, service between the two major cities by doing this one-stop, no-pick-up passengers at Bedwell Harbour. Now, I'm not going to get into the economic arguments as to whether there should be monopolies on any flight, whether if, West, if Air West had a monopoly, they would give a better and safer service than if there are two carriers flying that route on a non-stop basis. But I want you to understand that we have license conditions, very hard for the man in the street to grasp, that the plane takes off, lands in the Gulf Islands, opens the door, closes it again, doesn't take on any passengers, and then flies into Vancouver or reverse into Victoria. That kind of thing must be properly uh, explained. I would, in, in fact, blame the federal authorities for allowing this kind of situation to develop. I'm not going after West Coast. I fly with them all the time and will continue to do so. I'm not going after Air West. I fly with them all the time and will continue to do so. And Air West, as a matter of fact, does the same kind of thing on its flight to Powell River. The plane, the float plane to Powell River, must put down in Blubber Bay and Texeda Island as a technical stop. Now, the lesson I'm giving you is... Why should the hazard of flying ever be increased at all by these stops required under the licenses so that people can compete? In case I haven't made myself too clear, I'm going to have people on from West Coast and Air West together at the first possible opportunity. Hate to see all these plane crashes. Now, 
My guest this morning is a man, and I shouldn't admit this in advance, for whom I have the utmost admiration. He's a man who has very little to be modest about. Robert Baird McClure, former moderator, he's not a minister, of the United Church of Canada. And what this man knows about world conditions and what he's done in his own little way to improve them in the underprivileged part of the world is quite, what's the word, a legend in itself. Dr. McClure and Webster after this break. <laughs> Are you fine? Yeah. Don't put any whiskey in Dr. McClure's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? Yeah. That'd be an achievement. <laughs> Who is Doris Thompson? Coming back in 30 seconds. Chuck says you can take the hey? I feel, because I've interviewed Dr. McClure a number of times, that everybody knows him, and that everybody knows his background. He's had enough adventures and experiences to fill half a dozen books, real life adventures, Boxer Rebellion way back in the good old days. He's worked in his field as a surgeon everywhere from the Gaza Strip to India. He's been with the Chinese in the bad old days, and he met Mao Zedong in the bad old days. He was around China then, he's worked in every part of the world, and he was the first lay moderator of the United, Canada, the United Church of Canada. He's not a reverend. Right. Although he is revered. <laughs> not sure. Yeah, brush <laughs> modestly. And somebody has written a book about him. I haven't had time to read it yet. There's a book up, McClure, Years of Challenge. And it tells some of the incredible experiences that he had in his mission. What is your mission in life, Dr. McClure? I think to use my medical uh, ability where it is needed most and where I get most thrill out of uh, doing the medical work. That's my job. Tell me one of the stories about the old days in China, though, when you were involved. Well, with... I think the thing in China, when I went to China, you see, I went to take the place of a doctor who had been murdered by bandits. and. Uh, I had to walk past his grave every morning, and we were in a very bad bandit country. At the time, it seemed to be utter chaos. What we realized was this was the build-up for a revolution, for the second revolution. So one of the very early things I had to do was to have a bandit ward and a police ward. You know, if you put bandits, it doesn't say anything in the medical textbooks about it, but if you put bandits and police in the same ward, it generates a very unfriendly spirit, quite a bit of tension, quite a bit of tension. And so we had to set up a bandit ward of about 40 beds or so. They're supposed to check their weapons, everybody, police and bandits, all checked their weapons when they came in. We had an understanding with the police. The bandits got 24 hours head start so that we would give the bandit back his weapon. What year was that? This was between 1923 and 19, uh, 1927. And it went on right up until 1937 to the outbreak of the uh, Sino-Japanese War. In the Sino-Japanese War, you were deeply involved then too. Yes, I tried to be a Red Cross worker and arrange exchange of prisoners between the uh, Japanese and the uh, guerrillas, but you know, it never came off, as the Japanese put a price on my head. And uh, I didn't want anybody to cash that check. It, they, they take a very dim view, actually, of Red Cross workers. They and think that they were in. You were working with the guerrillas at that time, were you not? Yes, yes, because they were where the wounded were. And who were the guerrillas? You must remember, not everybody knows. The guerrillas were, at that time, they were a hodgepodge of uh, bandits, uh, uh, idealist young people, unemployed, who got a hold of some weapons and uh, felt they should fight Japan. And later on, many of those people were thoroughly organized into the communist armies, but at that time they were pretty loosely coupled. That became the Chinese Eighth Route Army, as I recall. Yes, well, they, they were enlisted into the Eighth Route Army, you're right. You were then operating under the aegis of Chiang Kai-shek's forces. Right. Yeah, that was, a mis that was difficult too, because the Eighth Route Army were anti Chiang Kai-shek as well as being anti-Japanese, so they, it made a lot of tension. As you look around the world in all these years, you've been a surgeon in areas of need. Um, do you think things are improving or are they getting oh, yes, worse? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm a glandular optimist. I, 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 I think uh, things are improving. They're improving a great deal. You only have to take China. The people are much better off in China than they ever were before. You only have to take India. They're infinitely better off in India than they were 30 years ago. 
Uh, you see, people going, tourists going to those countries, look at those countries. When you go to those countries, you compare that country with Canada. And you say, my, that's in an awful mess, sanitary conditions, nutrition, that sort of thing. But if you compare that country in 1979 with that country in 1949, you say, my gosh, this is a terrific uh, improvement in what there was. Uh, in India, railways are improved, nutrition has improved, schools have improved, colleges all over the place. Uh, medic health services are taken for granted, which didn't even exist. One of India. your great campaigns in India, as I recall, was on birth control. Right, family planning. Family planning. And you used to, what would you call them, tubal ligations by the dozen. By the hundreds, please. By the hundreds. Please, please. Not by yes. the dozen. By Not the by the dozen. Not by the dozen. No dozen. resistance. Did, but no, no. They, were you only they making, for them. You were only making a tiny dent in an impossible situation. No, I wasn't. I was setting an example that was uh, later on copied. We were working out techniques and procedures that were copied. And today in Bangladesh, you won't believe it, but in a Muslim country where they don't like men doctors mucking about their women, uh, they take girls from 10th grade of high school, of schooling, prim uh, the second year high school, they give them one year's training, they send the girls out in teams to do tubal ligations under local anesthetic. And they do, a team of two girls is expected to do 500 tubal ligations a year. Their infection rate is 1% below that of the university hospital. Uh, th these are things you see, we can't, we can't even picture them in our country. The Medical Association doesn't approve of that sort of thing. But in that country, it is meeting the needs of those people. Who did these things? Who inspired these things? The people themselves? Yeah, the people themselves. In, oh, in, in Bangladesh, it was a very able surgeon who's also a fellow of the Royal College, and, and uh, he got this idea of this is the way to meet the medical needs of my people. Uh, and, it, and, and it's accepted, accepted in England very, very well, because they realize, we must realize that in, whether it's in politics, whether it's in industry, whether it's in agriculture, we must meet their needs, not to show them our needs, not to try and solve our needs. One of your most difficult periods, and I want to talk about it before I talk about something else, must have been your, your time. Was it a year as lay moderator of the United Church? Two years, two and a half. Two years? Yeah. That was yeah. a big money job for you. Big money job. I didn't take the money, <laughs> but I, I took the job. And it was, very, it was very good fun because it enabled me to uh, get to know Canada. And I got to know the church folk, the uh, neighboring church folk. It got me around Canada marvelously because I was able to go from Labrador right over to But how to much the of the last, night. you are now 78 years of age. Yeah. How right. much of the last 78 years, how many of the last 78 years have you spent in Canada? About um, uh, two or three. <laughs> two or three. What Two or three. Think? I speak the language of the natives. <laughs> it's all right. What do you think of us? What do you honestly think of us today? Looking at it as a former moderator, I want... Oh, let me tell you. I think Canada is amongst the most blessed nations in the world. That's what I think. Not the question I asked you. I said, what do you think of the average Canadian today in his outlook and attitude to the world around him? Well, he's improving. I'll say that. And he's got, still got quite a ways to go. That's why, I'm, that's why I like to go around and talk to him, because I think he has. I think we have not yet presented the Canadian. The Canadian has taken the benefits of affluence and a high standard of living and has not yet perhaps learned all the responsibilities that come from that in the world. Dr. McClure, we'll be back with uh, the good Dr. McClure after this materialistic commercial message. <laughs> Well, you've come a long way since you were first a barefoot doctor. But from what you said in the last segment of the interview, you advocate the training of people to do less than fully qualified medical Paramedical. procedures. Paramedical. 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 And I think this is one of the things we have to recognize. We have to recognize that in all these lines, for instance, in, in agriculture, we may take a person with a very low knowledge of agriculture, but if he knows, that, say, fish farming, or if he knows how to handle miracle rice, these are the things. He learns one thing, learns it well, and then go out. This is the sort of thing they can afford. They can't afford in the third world often. They can't afford to have a man who has taken a full agricultural course to tell them how to farm fish and that sort of thing. Uh, to selfish Canadians, and we're all pretty selfish materialistic in this country, by and large, how does the good Dr. McClure, who's seen whereof it's at, 
regard our one-on-one -on -one sponsorship offer for the Vietnamese boat people. And let me tell you first, Dr. McClure, that I don't believe 25% of the Canadian people are in favor of the boat people coming into the country. Well, I'm very proud that Canada has offered to take 50,000 of them by the end of 1980. I think it, be, it, it shows that we have a, still, still have a sense of compassion. I think it's a nice program divided between civilian effort and the government effort, private effort and the government effort. I think it is a tremendous demonstration to the world. If we did, if we took more, I think we might get some ethnic indigestion or whatever you want to call it. If we took less than that, I think our bona fides would be in question. Having done it, I think there is a tremendous field that we should explore of using Canadian money to help those other nations who have the desire but not the money to settle the boat people in the tropical countries of the South Pacific and so on, uh, Southeast Asia. And we could do that. We are asking people with an income of $200, $500 a year, why don't you settle refugees? Why don't you settle refugees? And our income is around 7000 What we should do is to say, for every family, we should explore the idea that for every family of boat people you take, we'll give you, let's say, $2,000 the first year. Then we'll give you to get them started on their farm. We'll give you perhaps up to $2,000 the second year. We'll give you taper off and we'll give you $1,000 the third year. The total would be $5,000. If you can't settle them in three years, then let them go out again. You've put them out again. Now, the thing is that we're budgeting between uh, ten dollars and $15,000 a family to bring them to Canada. Now, I say over and above our 50000 now that we have our reputation established, now let's offer this to some of the other places because the resistance to some of these places is purely economic. They say, listen, we're barely able to scrape a living at $400 a year. How the dickens can we take in boat people? But they have land. They have opportunity. They have, you, you think of some of these places where they're importing outboard motors, chainsaws. They have nobody to repair the outboard motor or chainsaw. They're putting in a diesel engine. They have nobody to repair a diesel engine. They, they, they have a, a, a building up a lumber business and that sort of thing, but they haven't got anybody to tell them how to run a lumber business, the business end of it, the export end of it. And, and the Vietnam people are specialists in that line. Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs is what we want. And private enterprise. Private enterprise. This is a chance for private enterprise to take a big leap forward in the third world. That's, of course, why they're being thrown out of Vietnam. That's they're right. Politically That's right. or socially desirable. That's right. That's right. Against the communist cause. Let me get your plan, then. This is the McClure plan. <laughs> I don't know. I just say that no. it's worth exploring. Let I me, think it's worth exploring. Let me spell out the McClure plan. Oh, first of all, we know that Cambodia has got millions of refugees in camps, haven't it? Yeah, not millions. No, they have they have a large number. Large number. Yeah. In yeah. fact, there yeah. are refugees all throughout Southeast Asia. What we Asia. don't know is that people in Hong Kong, with all the crowded conditions in Hong Kong, in the last six months, Hong Kong has given permanent jobs to 14,000 of these boat people and have 64,000 still in their camps, and they say to Canada, can't you help us with the 64,000? All right, name a country, if I may be brusque with you, Dr. McClure. Name a country that would be prepared to accept the McClure plan. Just a minute, the McClure plan being that uh, McClure would say, speaking for Canada, you take X number of refugees, yep. and we'll give you $2,000 the first year to establish them, $2,000 the second year, and $1,000 the third year. And you can then give them a piece of land, give them tools, right. and they will become productive citizens of right. your country. Right. Which country could take any of them? Uh, first of all, North Borneo could take them. That's under Malaya. I think the outer islands of Java could take them. West Irian, which used to be uh, New Guinea, uh, Dutch New Guinea. I think with the, many of the Central American places. I think Guyana, where Jim Jones used the Kool-Aid on his people. I think that sort of a place could take them. I think it's a tropical country. I think, I think there are other Central American areas that could take them. I think there could be a great benefit in some of those, uh, some of those places. I'm not sure about what the Peruvian jungle could not take them. They're waiting for development. They lack entrepreneurs. South they, America at large might take a large number. They might. They might, and I think that we could make it financially beneficial to them. And I think in Central and South America, you have the benefit there that they're not afraid of getting an ethnic, uh, changing the ethnic balance by importing a lot of Chinese race. Whereas we are, of course, delicate. We're a little bit afraid, and Malaya is afraid. I'll say quite frankly, Southeast Asia is afraid of changing the balance by having a lot of, in, uh, of Chinese ethnics come in. But I think it could be handled. Why are they afraid? 
Oh, why are we afraid? I don't know. We were afraid of immigration. Canadians are afraid of immigration. Basically, it's because of economic competition. I think we should sweeten it. I pain them. Not a bad idea, is it? Tell me about this guy who wrote the book about you. What's his name? Monroe Scott. Old Monroe friend? Monroe Scott is a personal friend, and he went out... Uh, before he wrote the second book, he went out to, he said he went out to see if any of my patients lived. But actually, he went out to get background information. And he traced uh, from all my friends and uh, everybody out there, even some of my enemies, he chased them up and, and uh, got their version. I think he's done a very good job. High adventure. On it. That's right. Adventure. Risk with a purpose. Give me, give me some of it. Let's, let's live vicariously, secondhand, through the incredible experiences of Bob McClure. Well, I think in India, the, the, the adventures in India were not so much physical adventures as social adventures. Namely, you are trying to introduce, let's say, introduce family planning to a place where originally they are, they are very reactionary to it. You introduce, try to introduce vasectomies in a place where they're machismo for the, for the men and that sort of thing. And you know, when you're introducing that sort of thing for the men, you have to start at the top and work down. You don't start at the bottom and work up. Now, you so, so the, by very good luck in India, you see, the first uh, uh, gentleman who uh, wanted to have uh, 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 his operation came to me. He was a, a district court judge. And he said, now, Bob, he said, you can do this operation. I said, of course, you can do it in 10 minutes under locals. Nothing at all. I said, nothing at all. He said, but I want it done specially. He said, I don't want to come in. I said, you just come in in the operating room. The girls don't, the, the operating staff, the scrub nurse and everybody, they don't know you're a judge or anything else. I said, with a towel over your face and the drapes for the operation. I said, they don't know who you are. No, no, but he said, I don't want any girls in the room when you do me. And I don't want to be done in the ordinary time. So we had to put on a special performance for him, 9 o'clock at night. And of course, everybody in the city wanted to know what the lights were on <laughs> in the operating room. And then the judge staggered out, you see, with a kind of a, kind of a hobbled gait for a little while and this sort of thing. He says, you won't tell anybody, will you? But by the next morning, everybody knew. The whole the town judge. knew. The whole town knew. And what's good for the judge is good for Willie. Webster and Dr. McClure. <laughs>
and he'd say, now I'll come along in the morning and see if anybody's dying, and if they, you can get off at noon, he would go down in his little uh, Morris Minor and go down to the seashore and get a fish right out of the Mediterranean, you know, still, still with his gills still working, and he'd make the most marvelous fish, and his wife was a great cook. They had a wonderful family, husband and wife, and and, and uh, four kids, two boys and two girls. And, and when, when, when my wife was coming out, I was out there alone. He says, you're very lonely. You're very lonely here. Now he said, you're, uh, my wife had had a major operation. She was coming out in uh, 1952. And I said, you know, I, I just must warn you. He said, when your wife comes, we're going to have the daddy of all our meals. And I said, well, just take it easy. Just take it easy. I said, my wife doesn't eat fish. She's a little allergic to fish. Oh, there's lots of other things we have. Lots of other what things we have. have. And so they came. They came. They, my wife came out. I brought her out. came out with her. And we had the Sunday. And they had the most marvelous. They laid it right on. Robinson and Cleaver, Linen, Mappin and Webb, Silverware. And Papa brought in the kids. Each kid was trained beautifully. They brought in the hors d'oeuvres. And then they brought in the soup, and then the entree came in. Here it was a sheep's head. Papa says, this is much too good to eat with a knife and fork. He pulled off his coat, and he dug his hands into the eyes and took the two eyes and put them on a plate. My wife was just post-operative. <laughs> and she sort of looked at these things and sort of reeled around and looked terribly green, these two sheep's eyes looking up at her. She said, oh, my husband loves the eyes and put them over on my plate. What the heck could I do, sheep's eyes? So help me. It's quite a job, you know, particularly if you've done any ophthalmology, you know, to eat. <laughs> I, you know, it, it's very, very difficult, but you realize how different they were. And then I asked me, Dr. Abu Gazelle, I said, you know, you have such a lovely family here, your relationship between husband and wife and all the kids and everything. I said, I think it's marvelous. And I said, Canadians are notorious for not expressing their gratitude. And I said, I want you to know that I think it's the most marvelous family and I appreciate your hospitality. And he said to my horror, he said, well, you know, this isn't the first Mrs. Abagazala. And I said, oh, my, I'm sorry. I presume she died some ghastly death. And, and he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, it was nothing, it was nothing. He said, you see, when I, was, uh, when I was 16, I was a very bright boy. I came from a very good family here, but they were a little bit short of money at the time. Falouse, fish falouse. And uh, Falouse. he said, we were a little bit short of money at the time. So I wanted to go on to uh, 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 post-secondary education. I wanted to be a doctor. So he said, we fixed it all up. They married me to a 40-year-old Iranian <laughs> widow. And he said, it was marvelous. I had what she wanted. She had what I needed. It was, everything was fine. He said, it was just marvelous, you see. And so he said, we went up to Beirut. There were the other fellas with all their hang-ups, and they were short of money and living in cheap boarding houses. We had a nice apartment and that sort of thing. So of course, he said, I had no worries in life. I had all the books. I had my own microscope. He said, I, I, I finished at the top of my class after five, five years at the university, and I wanted to take some postgraduate work, so in tropical medicine, so we went to London. He said, the only address we knew was Baker Street from reading Sherlock Holmes. So, so he said, I got an apartment on Baker Baker Street. And he said the same thing there. He said, here are the postgraduate students, all their women <laughs> hang-ups and everything. And we were living in luxury. We'd bring them over to our apartment. And then he said, I came back to Gaza and I was setting up in practice. He says, you know, setting up in practice as a new doctor, he said, I didn't want to be married to an old hag like that. So he said, I, I halas the lady, you know. Yeah, I divorced her. Yeah, just like that. And I said, Doc, I said, that's a terrible thing. I said, after all that thing, to drop the lady who done it? He says, no problem, no problem. He says, in three months, she married another medical student. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I see we have all kinds of scholarships, road scholars and that, but wait till we get the bedroom scholarship. Boy, oh boy, it's the real yeah, stuff. Indian so I said to him, I said, look, I said, tell me, Doc, I said, when you're sitting down at the table now, I said, if the souffle's gone flat, or I said, the roast is a little bit burnt, I said, are you going like this under the table to Mrs. Abagazala? He said, Doc, he said, you don't understand. You don't understand our custom. He said, the present Mrs. Abagazala comes from a very powerful family. Her brother was mayor of Gaza, by the way. He said, she has very powerful brothers. He said, the idea of divorce never crosses my mind. <laughs> <laughs> enough. Alas, enough, enough, enough. Are you going to be on show today at all anywhere in Vancouver? I'm going to be autographing books at the Bay at noon. And I, uh, there are many people, many of your friends will want to see you. I think so. Monroe Scott will be there. Monroe too. Scott will be there in person. Yes, yes. You know, Very that's good. the first time I've really seen you in action, not just as a theologian or a surgeon. Moderator. <laughs> Moderator. First time I've seen you in action as a stand-up comic. I think you're fantastic. 
Really good. Very best of luck, Dr. McClure. Thank I shall see you the next time you come, of course. I hope so. I hope Strengthen so. my resolve on Project X. Don't mention yes. it. Don't mention it. I shall not. Don't mention it. Don't mention it. Bye, Allah. My thanks to Allah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. My thanks to Alhamdulillah. the famous Dr. Robert Baird McClure. And the very best of British luck to him. I'll be back with a free for all. He's got to go somewhere else in the hurry, unfortunately, after the break. I hope I made myself clear this morning in trying to explain to you the complications of the one-stop conditions in certain air companies' licenses in British Columbia. And let me make my point clear again, if I may, that a landing or a takeoff does not cause crashes, but unnecessary landings and takeoffs due to the conditions of licenses does increase the hazard. And it is a fact that these things, on a percentage basis on the long scale, do increase the hazard. And mystified members of the public must be properly and lucidly reassured about what is going on, especially when we've had somewhat of a rash of uh, plane crashes on the West Coast. You know, it's really quite, one doesn't really know what's supposed to be happening. We know that Air West flies Vancouver, Victoria. We know that West Coast Air flies Vancouver, Victoria. We know that West Coast Air also has a commitment and does serve the Gulf Islands. But for certain purposes at certain times, it drops in to make its required landing at Bedwell Harbor and takes off again. Uh, in my checks this morning, trying to catch up on what's been happening, I found that similarly West Coast does the same thing at Tuxedo. And you've seen the stuff in the papers about PWA making applications not to make certain unnecessary stops from their view so that they can complete properly with the even, with the, I think it's CPA on the, the flight to Cal